Optimal Bio podcast. At Optimal Bio, we don't just balance your hormones, we balance your whole body. Our conversations range from nutrition to medicine with an emphasis on wellness tips to support your health journey. If you like what you hear, find us on the web at optimalbio.com and follow the podcast so you don't miss an episode. All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Optimal Bio Podcast. Today, we're excited to introduce Candy Brown, our newest PA, joined us a few weeks ago, and we thought we would introduce her to our community. So Candy, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I do first want to say I'm a nurse practitioner. <laughs> oh, my apologies. I gave that's you promotion. Okay. No, yeah, that's fine. It's fine. Um, so I'm actually from Nightdale, North Carolina. Uh, it's about 15 minutes east of Raleigh. I have grew up here in North Carolina. I've never left. Um, I was first a registered nurse working in the emergency department at um, Wake Med. I worked there for about nine years. Prior to that, I was working in the emergency department at Duke Raleigh. Um, I've always loved nursing and healthcare. It's been um, part of my life for a really long time, a deep desire. Me and my husband just recently moved to Wilmington, North Carolina two weeks ago. We are beach people through and through. We love the coast. Um, We have a dog named Ruby. She is our child. Um, And we're really enjoying Wilmington so far. Um, We're still, you know, getting settled and unpacking. And I'll be running the um, Wilmington office for Optimal Bio. So I'm excited to get that going and staffed um, and meet all of our patients some more. So far, all of our patients have just been so beautiful and so fun to talk to. And I've loved them so much. So just a quick question for my curiosity. Is Candy short for Candice? It is. My dad um, actually started that when I was really little, and it's just stuck all the way through. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Um, so let's walk, go back for a little bit and tell us about your emergency room experiences. What was that like? Yeah, so um, starting all the way to the very beginning, uh, as a little girl, I always knew I wanted to be in healthcare. Um, I originally wanted to be a doctor, a pediatrician to be specific. As I got older, I learned that med school costs a lot and requires a lot of time. So then I switched my mindset to nursing, and I was like, I'm going to do nursing. So all through high school, I did all my science classes. I needed to be a nurse. Um, After I graduated, you know, you're young, and you want to just have fun. So I changed at the last minute. My parents were not pleased at all. Um, So fast forward a little bit, I found um, my way back to nursing after working um, in the government for a few years. I went back to school, got my CNA 1 and 2, and I'm seeing CNA 1 and 2 because there's a difference, especially working in an emergency department. So I started my journey as a CNA 2 at Duke Raleigh in the emergency department, Um, loved working there, loved everything everyone was doing. I got accepted to nursing school, started my journey through nursing school. Um, Like I said, as a child, pediatrics has always been something I've loved. So I ended up taking a job in the children's emergency department at Wake Med while I was um, completing nursing school, worked there as a CNA too, completed nursing school, got my RN, and continued to work in the children's emergency department as a new grad nurse and worked my way up to being a charge nurse. While I was working at Wake Med, I entered grad school, and here I am, a nurse practitioner. So it's been a long journey, and everyone jokes by this point I should be a doctor because I've spent like 10 years in school. Sure. But nursing is, um, I believe, the heart of medicine and the backbone to doctors. So I'm glad I went the nursing route, and I love nursing. I love my fellow nurses. I love being a nurse. Um, I will say that once COVID hit, it really made myself and my fellow nurses question um, being nurses and working in healthcare. That was an uh, extremely trying time, and I'm glad I found my way to Optimal Bio. So I was able to um, leave that behind. I hate I left a lot of you know good nurses behind, but I know that they're going to find their way to um, their calling. So you get out of high school and you take a couple of years, then you decide you're going to be a nurse. So 
Walk us through CNA one and two. What does that mean? And how do you get those certifications? Yeah, absolutely. So um, to even get accepted to a nursing program, most of your schools, especially in North Carolina, require you to at least be a CNA one. So a CNA one is a certified nursing assistant one. Um, And the difference between a certified nursing assistant one and two is the skills that you can actually do. Working in the emergency department, especially at Duke Raleigh, they only would hire CNA twos because we could do more skills such as Foley catheters, um, blood draws, um, oxygen therapy. There's just more that we could help our nurses with than a CNA one could do. Okay, and then you go to nursing school and where'd you go? So yeah, my, um, I actually started at Johnson Community College, got my associate's degree in nursing. Immediately started working as a new grad fellow um, nurse in the Children's Emergency Department at Wake Med. Once I finished my fellowship and got my feet nice and wet, um, I then completed my Bachelor's of Science in Nursing at Winston-Salem. That was um, about a year program because I'd already had everything I needed. I didn't have to do any extra classes. It was just straight nursing classes to get my bachelor's. So I com- I was going to say, so one could argue you took the uh, most cost-effective way to get your degrees, um, you know, because in my world, you know, we hear about, you know, kids who graduate high school and they're going off to Duke Nursing School, for example, or mm-hmm. ECU or what have you. Yeah. So uh, what's the difference? Yeah. I'm glad you say that because it's so funny. My dad now tells me I told you so. He actually wanted me to go to community college first as soon as I graduated high school and then go to a university course. I just did everything all backwards as teenagers usually do. Um, So it is more cost effective. Of course, you do have to have all your prerequisites done no matter where you go to school, university or community college. However, a community college is much cheaper. probably less than half the cost of a university. Um, It is a two-year program as well, so it's actually more clinical-based than it is lecture. So you're actually doing more hands-on than you are sitting in a class learning about theory or what have you. Um, But going that route, I was able to go ahead and start working as a nurse while while I completed my bachelor's. So for me, it just made more sense because I wanted to go ahead and start working start learning, start making money. Um, and also, I will say, Wake Med is really good with supporting um, their nurses and their staff with education, um, not just financially, but um, management's really good with flexibility and supporting you through that whole journey. So that was um, extremely beneficial for me. And I don't know if you can answer this question or not, but is there a, once you get your bachelor's degree and you know, you're hired by, let's say, Wake, and even though you already worked in there before you got your bachelor's degree, is the salary level the same no matter where you go from a school perspective? Yeah, so um, actually, Wake Med is now a magnet hospital. They became magnet a few years ago. So most magnet hospitals require you to have your bachelor's. Um, they prefer not to hire an ADN nurse. Fortunately, I was already working there as an ADN. However, they make you sign a contract saying within five years that you'll get your um, BSN, your bachelor's, um, while you're still working here. So, yeah, there's, I mean, if you start out with a bachelor's, I think there's a slight increase maybe um, than an ADN nurse. But all fellow graduate nurses, I believe, start at the same pay rate if you go through their fellowship program. Um, It's been a while since I went through that program, so I'm really not sure if that's how it still is. I know that's how it was when I started. And I do want to say Wake Med's fellowship program for nursing is awesome. I don't know what other hospitals offer um, a fellowship like Wake Med does. They really do a great job easing a new nurse into the role of being a nurse on the floor with patients. The... um I guess when the question, I guess, is when you got your bachelor's degree, did you get a bump in pay at that oh, point? No, I did not. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How do they normally bump your pay? Is it just a, so yeah, it's uh, a yearly, annual increase, basically? Yeah, it's an annual okay. increase. Um, it is. So we have what's called clinical ladders. Um, we don't call it a clinical ladder. I'm saying that because most hospitals do call that uh, call it a clinical ladder. Uh, Wake Med, it's called... Um, MP, MPD. So it's basically if you work towards so many points to get a raise. So having a BSN gives you more points to get more money. So it does come into play 
for that, and that's completely voluntary. You don't have to go through the clinical ladder program at all. I did every year because I enjoyed doing projects and um, doing the extra things and getting the extra money for it. I mean, a lot of it was just stuff we were already doing. Like, you really didn't have to go so far out of your way to get it. So in that um, respect, yes, you will get extra money for your BSN if you're part of that clinical ladder. So when you first started, when you were a registered nurse, when you got your degree and certification or what have you, not when you were a CNA, but when you started nursing through the time that you left, um, ha- did your role change a lot just from the evolution of medicine and everything else? From the beginning? Is that what you're asking? Well, no. Just, so let's forget about the when you were a CNA one and a CNA two. So when you became a nurse, mm-hmm. um, you know, and I don't know how, let's assume that was five years ago. Um, what was your daily role like then compared to oh, what it was yeah. when you actually left? Right. So yeah, um, when I started out as a nurse, I was con- I was a new grad, so brand new nurse in the fellowship program. Um, it takes a good year. They give you a good year for a new nurse to get comfortable on their own. You always have someone as a resource. So during that time, I was learning that I already kind of knew the department because I worked there as a CNA. So shout out to anyone who works as a CNA and you're going back to nursing school, do it in a unit you want to work in. <laughs> you'll get to know, you'll know the unit and it'll be so much easier as a nurse. You can just focus on nursing. So anyways, going back. Um, so yes, as I progressed through my years there from new grad to, um, I guess you would say, a s- experienced nurse or senior nurse, um, I moved from having my assignments to doing triage, trauma, and then at the end, about three years before I left, I ended up becoming a charge nurse. Charge nurses are basically like your management of the unit when management's not able to be there or uh, management's busy. Like you don't want to keep bugging your manager or your supervisors. It's just the hierarchy of who you go to when there's an issue. So charge nurses are kind of like your your management on the unit right there in the middle of everything. They are the resource for everyone to go to, doctors, nurses, um, your financial staff, everyone kind of comes to them, literally, especially at night. I will say I did work night shift the whole time during my medical career for over 11 years. I've only worked night shift. I've never worked during the day. And so the difference with day shift and night shift is you have less resources. So working nights, I really had to know the unit and know where to turn to and what to do in case a crazy situation would come up. I'm the person everyone's going to come to and be like, what do we do? So being a charge nurse at night shift is even more difficult because you're you're kind of essentially on your own. You have people you can reach out to in the hospital, but you are the person in charge of that unit that your nurses and other staff are going to come to. So as you become a charge nurse, then are you touching the patient less than what you were doing before? Is it more administrative? No, it's actually more work, believe it or not. It's more work, more stress. Um, because you're trying to make sure that the patients are continuing to flow through. Um, You still have a lot of your newer nurses or newer staff who aren't familiar with your unit, so you're helping them. You're still doing patient care because when you're just, weight med's a busy emergency department. And when you're that busy, like as me personally as a charge nurse, I wanted to make sure my staff was good and I would help them any way I could. So a lot of times I'd be, let me go in a room and see if I can get an IV on a patient or let me go handle this task for you. So I was very much a hands-on charge nurse. I can't speak for everyone, but for myself, I was very much hands-on. If, for example, I saw triage getting backed up, I would go out there and start helping triage. Um, I always tried to do whatever I could to help my staff so they didn't feel like they were drowning and I wasn't there to support them. The, so then you continue. So as you're going through, you becoming this charge nurse and you're, you know, by the way, why did you stay on nights? Was that by choice? Um, I was already so used to it. And also speaking of pay, you actually get paid a lot more to work nights. So I was like, well, the money's good. I'm used to it already. I like the environment at night. There's less staff in the hospital. Um, I like the autonomy that I had that, you know, it was up to me to figure out situations or how to handle whatever would come up. Um, I just enjoyed the environment, basically, and the extra money. <laughs> so is it true, too, that less things happen at night than they do during the day? Oh, no. More happen at night, I, s- I promise you. I think it gets crazier at night, and we always joked um, around 
I guess between 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. is when we'd see probably our most highest volume. And we'd always joke like, yep, everyone's gone home, ate their dinner. Now their problems are surfacing, so here they come. And it was every night we would get slammed between those times. This is obviously the emergency room, but if, right. did you work on a floor at some point in time? And was it quieter on the floor? I've never worked anywhere else but the emergency room. Um, I've always been in the emergency room, I, so I really can't speak about the floors, but um, I have like floated up to like the pediatric floor for a few hours to either orient or help out, but not enough to really speak about how their um, environment was at night or their volume. I do know we had a lot of admissions and we would hold admissions, so I know they had to be busy because they're full, but um, I can't speak for them essentially. Yeah, because you hear stories these days about, you know, people coming in and, you know, they're, if there's not enough of those holding rooms within the ER, then they're on the, in the hallway, basically. They are. And uh, obviously, it's a triage situation. So the, you know, acute that are treated get, get the rooms first, I guess. Um, yep. I always wondered, though, how logistically the hospitals handle the flow from, you know, ER up to the whatever floor you're going to. Yeah, Any it's all, on that? Yeah, so it's all um, dependent on your um, level of care. When I say level of care, that means are you like an ICU patient? Are you a step-down? A step-down patient would be you're not quite, um, I want to say worse, but you're not quite there for ICU, but you're not you know, good enough to be just on like a, um, a regular me medical floor. Like you're kind of in between. You still need a little bit more close monitoring. Um, so you'd have your ICU patients, your step down patients, and then you'd have your medical or surgical patients. And depending on where you fall within that would depend on when you, where you got a room and then when, depending on how that unit's volume was. Um, we did try to get our, like, I was mostly in pediatrics, so if our kids were ICU patients, especially our deaf breathers, if they were on vents or, like, our high-flow nasal cannula requiring a ton of oxygen, and they were more of a one-to-one -one or, like, um, one-to-one -one patient for ICU, we really tried to get them upstairs as quick as we can because, honestly, holding ICU patients in an emergency department is not safe. It's not safe for the patient. It's not safe for the nurse or the doctors because these patients really do require one-to-one -one monitoring in an emergency room. We just cannot do that because we have three or four other patients who require us to help them or something, a trauma could come in, and we just don't have the ability to provide that one-to-one. -one. You made an interesting comment before that things go crazy between seven and nine at night. Um, have there been like human psycho psycho psychological studies done that you were privy to as to why, you know, that uh, those hours are, are the witching hour, so to speak? Is no, it but I would be curious to see because we could almost bet money on you're going to see a spike in volume between those times. And I don't know what it is. We always just joked or chalked it up to, well, dinner time's over, so let's go. You know, I'm out of school, I'm out of work, we've ate dinner, oh, but here's this issue, we probably should go get it checked out. And that could be completely wrong and off. I don't want to make assumptions, but that's how it seemed or was perceived by us. Like, well, you've, you've gone to work, you've gone to school, you've eaten dinner, and now we have these issues because it was always during just those times. Of course, sometimes during our winter months when we were having a lot of our kids come in with like um, asthma or RSV, we'd stay busy all night long and we'd see spikes here and there. But most of the time it was either right there between that 7 and 9 p.m. window or they're just waking up early in the morning. Yeah, I kind of wondered if it's um, whatever happens to that child during the day. Um, yeah. You know, they're waiting to see if they're going to be better or... Right, yeah. Um, or the, we have to wait for the parents to come home to take them to the ER. So I guess right. uh, that's probably you know, what it's all about. Yeah, I'd be um, curious to see if there's like some research or study that's been done because I swear it's like that every night. <laughs> <laughs> Was that the same on the adult side also? Oh, goodness. So the adult side, they just stay busy the whole time. I don't even know what time's a good time for them, honestly. I feel bad for them because as even though I work mainly in the children's ER, we still had to go help over there because um, if they're drowning, we want to help them out if we could, if we had the staff and our volume wasn't crazy. So there had been many times I would actually go work on the adult side and they just stayed crazy the whole time. Their volume is insane and I don't know when a good time is to go there, but they're great. They're great at what they do. So let's talk a little bit about the elephant in the room. So let's 
go back in time to March 2020, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, when the hospitals decided to shut down and you were taking COVID patients only. Um, what was that like? I mean, I know you were pediatric, so it's, it's different. There weren't probably a lot of COVID cases for kids at that point in time. But, you know, what were you seeing on the ER in general? And uh, was it crazy with COVID? Yeah, so once um, COVID hit, honestly, our volume dropped tremendously. It's almost like everyone was afraid to leave their house. And so we didn't have the volume we were seeing. Like some nights or even days, like we'd barely have any patients come into either the children's ER or the adult ER. It got so bad that a lot of people were like either leaving um, to go take other jobs because we were trying to flex. We we're constantly flexing down our staff. And when I say flexing, that means we're saying, hey, um, you want to go home early or, hey, do you want to stay home because we don't need you? Um, so we had a lot of that happening. Um, nurses were taking roles in other departments, um, such as like screeners, just so they could get hours to get their money. So at the beginning of COVID, our volume was like nothing. because And I truly believe everyone was just scared to come out of their house. And then once the hospitals opened up again, what, a couple months later, did the flow go back to what it was? So yeah, once um, we opened back up, so to speak, um, and everybody wasn't afraid to stay, or wasn't afraid to come outside, our volume increased dramatically. And till this day, I left in December to this day, we have not been able to keep up at all. Um, and I'm, and it's, I'm going to say this, it's not all COVID. Um, the patients we are, we're seeing and still seeing were patients that stayed home, did not know, or no longer went to their primary care doctor or their specialist would not, were not cu- keeping up with their, um, comorbidities that were once managed on a routine basis. I feel like we saw a lot of that things that were just being left to kind of linger too long and they were just getting so bad that they had to come to the emergency room. Um, as far as kids, I feel like it stayed pretty the same. However, last year we did see like our RSV virus, which is a respiratory virus seen in children. We did see that spike earlier during the summer, whereas usually it doesn't spike tor- towards like um, mid to late winter. So we're seeing some stuff come back sooner. And I almost kind of wonder, like, is that because these kids were stuck at home and their immune systems were just kind of like, bleh. <laughs> they didn't have an immune system. So once they got outside, now they're getting all the viruses and here they are sicker than usual because they're now being exposed to stuff they haven't been exposed to probably in a year. So you seem to be a pretty ambitious and driven person. What made you decide to go get your NP? So I've, it's always I've honestly been a goal of mine to um, be a provider. Like I said, when I was a little girl, I wanted to be a doctor, a pediatrician to be specific and then realized that nursing was more for me. Um, As I worked through nursing, um, that goal never left me, never left that little girl in me. Um, So I was like, let's do it. Now's the time to do it. While I'm still fresh in healthcare, still ready to learn, let me go ahead and get my nurse practitioner. It just made sense being a nurse, and I love nurse practitioners. I see them personally for um, medical concerns, and I feel like as a nurse and a nurse practitioner, we have that bedside manner. We have the experience of being bedside, talking with patients, working through um, situations, and I really admire that about nurse practitioners because we're able to take what we've learned as nurses not only the knowledge, but how we communicate to patients and families and bring that into a more provider role where we can educate even more and provide, you know, those services um, to the patients. If you had to describe, I know you're a very uh, humble individual, but what's your secret sauce? Like, why are you unique and special um, as a nurse and now as a, a provider? Well, hmm. That's a good question. <laughs> um, I guess I would say I'm driven um, and I truly care about my patients and my family and friends and community. I really care about what people think, how they feel. It matters a lot to me. Um, and I feel like that probably makes me more unique. I'm just, I'm driven and I care. Um, most people can act like they care, but do they really? Um, and I really do. And it, it affects me if something's not right. 
either with a patient or a friend or a coworker, whoever, if something's not right, it, it affects me personally and emotionally. And I always want to try to get to the root of the problem because I don't want someone lingering out there, you know, with a problem with me or anything in general. I want to try to make them feel better and get them to where they need to be. So you obviously spent a lot of time at Wake and you've had a great career there. Um, what was there an event or was there something that took place that made you think about a career change? Yeah, so um, actually going, I already knew that women's health was a passion of mine just through my own journey um, with health issues as a woman. It was something that's always intrigued me and I've really loved uh, loved talking to other people about. Um, so during my nursing school career, and I say career because I felt like it took me a long time to get to where, <laughs> where I am, um, I enjoyed my rotation through women's health, both as a nurse and a nurse practitioner. It is something that hits home and I can relate to other patients about. I've experienced things and I understand a, a lot where they're coming from. Um, so I guess that would that's what I would say. So sh can I ask about yeah. that? How, will you, how do you relate to other patients? Yeah, so um, I will say I'm 38 years old. So many of our patients that we see here at Optima Bio are my age. Some are younger, some are older. But as a 38-year-old woman, I've um, already experienced infertility, PCOS, um, menstrual irregularities, so as well as um, having to completely go gluten-free because of... Um, gut issues as well. So I, I feel like I've experienced a lot in my 38 years, and I'm able to relate to these women who are going through the same thing. And many of them just want to hear that they're not alone and that other people have the same issues. Like, it's not taboo to have these health issues. It is taboo, though, to not address the root cause of them. And we just continue to put a Band-Aid on. I've experienced that. I've experienced the Band-Aid effect. And so I believe that because I've experienced that, now I can advocate for women. And so women's health is just, it's the heart of me. <laughs> so you obviously, went, you've had a personal journey with that um, over time. And I assume you started with, if you had these symptoms, you started obviously going to a traditional you know, OBGYN, right? I did. Um, mm -hmm. So kind of walk us through your journey and how you ended up, you know, being in a better place. Absolutely. So um, my journey actually started out when I was younger, um, probably late teens, early 20s. Um, I've always had migraines as a child, but even as a child, they I don't, I don't believe they were ever addressed by any doctors. It was just kind of like, here, take Tylenol, Motrin, you'll be okay. And that was it. So as a teen in my early 20s, my migraines kept getting worse, and I always had terrible like menstrual symptoms, cramps, PMS, um, bloating, mood swings, all the things. Um, I thought it was normal. So I go to my gynecologist, and she's the first person, honestly, who kind of opened my eyes up to holistic medicine and showed me that you don't need a medication for these things. There's things you can take that are natural, such as magnesium. It's great for migraines. She recommended that. And she also was persistent about trying to figure out what was wrong with me. She was checking my thyroid, my hormones. And then I met, um, so nothing really came of that. Just basically, let's check and see what's going on. Here's, take magnesium for your migraines. Try drinking, you know, more water. Try to cut out your sugars. Try to do things that could, you know, alleviate um, these symptoms. So then... Um, Moving forward, I meet my husband, and you know we get married and we want to start a family, and it's really difficult. And I don't know what's going on. Like we're, we tried our, by ourselves for a year, so I go to my gynecologist. I was like, we, you know, we've been trying. I don't know what's going on. I'm tracking my ovulation. I'm taking ovulation kits. I'm doing all the things I think are right. So once again, we're going to check our hormones. Um, so everything looks good. She did say my thyroid's a little off, so I go to an endocrinologist thinking, oh, maybe it's my thyroid that's causing, you know, this infertility issue. Endocrinologist at the time was like, no, you're fine. Your numbers aren't that far off. You're good. Go home. I was like, okay, cool. Don't know what that means. <laughs> so then I go back to my gynecologist. She's like, well, let me send you to a fertility specialist. They can do other testing and really, you know, see what's going on. 
So we went to um, a fertility clinic for about two years trying to figure out why I can't get pregnant. Um, their immediate solution was IVF, which is, you know, in vitro. And that's extremely expensive. That's $10,000. I was not willing to spend $10,000 without knowing what's wrong with me. Of course, my husband had to get checked and he was fine. But I'm, I'm not going to just jump straight to IVF. It costs so much money and I still don't know why I can't get pregnant. So at that time, I ended up going back to my gynecologist and seeing a nurse practitioner. This nurse practitioner, I love her. She is the best. She took her time to really dig deep to see why I'm having such issues getting pregnant. And she completely understood and sympathized with me as to, as to why I didn't want to do IVF and spend all that money. She agreed. She was like, I wouldn't do that either until I knew what was wrong. We did testing. We saw that I'm ovulating. We're like, okay, well, I'm ovulating. So then, you know, you jump straight to um, an ultrasound to see if there's something physically wrong. And that's when we discovered I have PCOS. So I want to jump back to that fertility doctor because I feel like this is really important. I've spoken about this many times. PCOS is not um, a one shoe fits all, but many people think it is. The fertility doctor at that time dismissed it immediately. He was like, no, I'm going to rule out PCOS. You don't fit a PCOS. This is just looking at me, looking at me physically. He's like, you don't fit the PCOS mold. You know, I'm not overweight. I don't have extra hair. I don't have all this acne. Um, I was like, oh, okay. Well, my gynecologist, you know, did the ultrasound. Well, I have PCOS. So PCOS is not a one shoe fits all. Anyone can have PCOS. It does not matter how you look physically. So that was, um, it was reassuring kind of because now I was like, oh, now I kind of have something to work with here. I kind of know what could be the problem. Um, so at that point, you know, me and my husband just kind of felt like fertility treatment was just not our thing. You know, we'd been through the different, you know, getting tested, trying to figure out it's emotional and it's mentally draining. So we're just like, we're going to stop. We know I have PCOS. We know I do ovulate. Um, and I told my doctor, I was like, you know, it's not my husband's belief per se. I was willing to go forward and do whatever I could, but he had religious beliefs about IVF he didn't agree with. So we're just like, we're going to stop. And we're just going to see what happens. So at this point in our life, we're just kind of leaving it up to um, God. If you believe in God or Jesus, we're very religious people and we do. So we're just going to leave it up to him. And we feel that if it's meant to be, it'll be. So that's been my journey as far as women's health. And as far as like my gut issues, um, I've always had issues, I guess, eating like certain foods, never knew what it was, would get upset stomach, have cramps just thought it was maybe me. I don't know. Um, so recently uh, I got tested for um, celiac and a gluten and it came back non-celiac gluten intolerant. So I do have a gluten issue. I feel like most people probably do. Cut gluten out last year. It's been night and day difference. Um, I have more energy. I feel good. I'm not bloated at all ever. Um, so I always recommend everyone try to cut gluten out because everything starts in the gut. And if you can heal the gut, then you're going to feel 10 times better. Um, and I will say that doctor also, I, I don't know if it's because I was, I'm a nurse or a nurse practitioner. I was never given any guidance once those results came back either as far as the gluten. It was kind of like, okay, well, I'll figure it out on my own. So that's my journey. <laughs> that's, a, uh, that's a fascinating story. And, um, you know, I've, it, it's, you know, you should be commended for, you know, the decision that you made and, um, um, you know, you, you trying to do things on your own and, and take those corrective measures. And from a diet perspective, uh, it seems like it's an ep epidemic these days. Um, you know, oh, it seems absolutely. like everybody we know, you know, has, you know, some type of a gluten intolerance. And mm -hmm. I know Dr. Brand and I have spoken about that before, you know, in various podcasts. Um, but, uh, you know, when you went through that, um, eliminating the gluten from your diet, uh, how long did it take before you started feeling better? And what are some of your tricks? Yeah, so going gluten-free is super tough, especially for someone like me who loves carbs and sweets. <laughs> um, so it was, it's been a journey for sure. My husband, um, he's been on and off keto for a few years. He's a huge advocate for the ketogenic diet. Um, so that's helped me as well, um, having his knowledge of you know how to eat keto, which is, you know, no carbs at all, basically 
meats um, and dairy. So as far as me cutting out the gluten, I, I really started slow. I always say don't set yourself up for failure. Start cutting it out little by little until you get used to um, being familiar with what has gluten in it, what gluten is, um, such as like your wheats and barleys and rice. Like just knowing what to eat is the first step. Um, and then I just found alternatives to things I love and it's been not so bad since then. I will say it took probably a good six months maybe till I really started feeling the effects of uh, feeling better and less bloating. Of course, it probably took me six months to really cut it completely out because it was very tough at first. But if you stick with it, I promise you, you will feel so good. I believe in it wholeheartedly. I will say that it seems to me that healthcare uh, people have a much more difficult time with their diet than others. I mean, you're on your feet a lot, you're moving around, there's no, oh, lunch break at noon, you know, dinner at six. Um, you know, if somebody leaves a pile of donuts on the, on the floor uh, or, you know, <laughs> you, go down to the, you go down to the vending machine, you would think in <laughs> hospitals they would have very, very good health options. And I know as a, uh, an individual who would visit family members in hospitals, um, you know, going out of cafeteria is a, a fate worse than death in most cases. Um, mm -hmm. So, <laughs> uh, you know, how did you overcome that? You know, when you're on the hospital, you're yeah. trying to, you know, become a lot more healthy, just, just had to bring everything in and turn your, close your eyes when you saw something that, you know, uh, six months ago you might've eaten. Yeah, um, it was really tough, especially at night. Because um, at night, the cafeteria closes early. So sometimes people will just order a bunch of like crappy food and that's what you got. So yeah, a lot of times I would bring my own stuff or if I would, you know, they always ordered pizza for us. I don't know why everybody always orders pizza for us. We're tired of pizza, by the way. <laughs> um, so like if they ordered pizza, I would always have to remind myself, remember how you feel when you eat it. You get upset stomach, you get the diarrhea, you get the cramping. And so I'd always have to remind myself, how I felt when I would eat those foods. And a lot of times that would stop me, be like, no, 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 you know how you're gonna feel as soon as you eat it, even nauseous. I'd get really nauseous too. Um, I will say Wake Med did try to change their um, selections in their cafeteria. They moved from like fried um, foods to using air fryers. They do have a section that is more like gluten-free friendly and whole foods. So their cafeteria has, it's pretty easy-ish to find a healthy snack that's gluten-free. Um, so, I mean, it does take some uh, mind power to kind of push through it, but I had a, I feel like I had a pretty good support group too at work because a lot of the girls I worked with were pretty health conscious as well. But just reminding myself that no, don't eat that because if you do, you're gonna be feeling really bad and it didn't take long for me to feel bad once I did eat something with gluten. Like it doesn't take long at all. So I just had to remind myself. So what'd you do to combat your sweet tooth? Oh yeah, the sweet tooth. <laughs> um, so I actually started eating more fruits. Um, I love blueberries and strawberries. Those are my go-to. So um, I also do like uh, granola, um, granola and coconuts um, and yogurt. So that helps me now with my sweet tooth. Um, that's really all I got for the sweet tooth. I, don't really eat the candy at all because that will mess you up in a minute. So, so before you decided to clean yourself up, uh, what was your favorite <laughs> dessert? Oh, my favorite dessert. Well, I have more than one favorite. <laughs> um, I love tres leches, which is a cake, a Spanish cake. It is so good. But also my other favorite, um, cake is actually my favorite dessert. My other favorite is strawberry cake. I love strawberries. <laughs> well, it seems like we're getting better and better gluten options these days. So maybe someday you could have, yes. you know, strawberry pie and not have to worry about the gluten. I know. Well, I, I do think that at Optimal Bio, it seems like we have uh, some providers that, um, you know, can be very relatable to patients, especially, um, well, on both sides, male and female, you know, just based on, you know, their personal histories and what have you. And I think that's what makes us... Uh, a little bit unique um, as well, because we're obviously, Automobile's Bio's mission is to, um, you know, prevent people from getting sick, or if you're, you know, not quite 
in the acute six stage, but mm-hmm. you know, you're walking around just kind of powering through fatigue and, you know, gut issues and, you know, other things that, um, you know, you're just simply not getting help on or you're just getting medicated, but it's, you know, making you feel better for three or four hours and then it comes back. Um, you know, it's kind of cool that we have the staff that, you know, has these, you know, has similar, you know, things that, um, you know, can be communicated and hopefully, uh, um, provide that knowledge back to the patients. Absolutely. I love it. So how'd you find out about automobile? Yeah. So actually my mom's been a patient here for years. This is actually how I found out about Optimal Bio. I remember when she first started coming, she was, she would always say, well, it's time for my pellets. And me and my sister would be like, what do you mean your pellets? We're like, you sound crazy. And then um, we would notice after she would get her pellets, um, we would start noticing when she needed them and we'd be like, have you got your pellets yet? Cause you need them. Um, <laughs> so just seeing her transition, she went through, um, a hysterectomy due to fibroids and had a really rough time after her hysterectomy with her hormones and symptoms really struggled. She was thrown, you know, all the things, the synthetic hormones, creams, patches, nothing would work. And she was just miserable. And so I noticed a huge difference when she switched to, um, the, bioidentical um, hormone replacement therapy pellets, she was like a new person. All these symptoms just disappeared. um, And she was just like back to her old self. And then just recently, she has switched off of the Synthroid and onto Armor. And it's night and day difference as well. And it just goes to show you that really, we just got to get back to our basics and foundation, like natural um, therapies really do help you. I mean, they're mimicking what your body is already trying to do. So my mom is who actually got me started into Optimal Bio. I um, actually did my specialty rotation for school for nurse practitioner here at Optimal Bio. So I really got to see how everything operated and worked and what we were truly doing for our patients besides, you know, from a personal aspect through my mom. And I loved it and enjoyed it. It provided me that women's health um, part that I love, as well as um, speaking with men. That was that's new for me, and I really enjoy it. And it just goes to show you that men and women both have hormonal issues. We kind of, I feel like, chalk it up mostly to women. No one ever kind of really looks at the men, unless, of course, we're talking about like maybe some fertility issues. Let's start looking at their testosterone. So I've really enjoyed seeing the. Um, Side of how this works for men. Um, and I love that we incorporate both men and women here. So it gives me a taste of both. And it's just been so great. And I love it. So you're down there in Wilmington, you've been given some responsibility. Um, you know, what are some of your goals? Like, what do you want to, what do you want that, that practice to look like a year from now? Absolutely. So for I love Wilmington. We moved there two weeks ago, like I said earlier, and I'm really getting to know the town. We're beach people through and through. I love the beach people. They are my kind of vibe. Um, so I'm excited to see Wilmington grow. I want the that practice itself to grow, to be fully functioning Monday through Friday. I want to get it out there to um, the community that, you know, what we're doing really does work and matters. And we're not putting a Band-Aid. We are truly fixing the root cause of how you're feeling. And I really want from a year near, see that hate that um, practice to be fully functioning and for everyone to be talking about optimal bio in Wilmington, how great they feel. You need to go see candy optimal bio. She's great. She's going to make you feel good. She, um, she is the happy hormone nurse practitioner. (laughs) Well, you obviously have a spirit about you and, uh, let's talk about, because we never really talk about this and you brought it up and I'm, I'm also a, a believer and, and, um, you know, I feel like I always need to, did need to do more, you know, with my spirituality. So how does spirituality play in your life? Um, so yeah, I believe in prayer. Prayer is huge. Um, I always say prayer, um, and believing has really gotten me through a lot. And I'm, I'm talking about illnesses, school, every, I mean, if you don't believe in prayer, you really should. And I'm not saying that, you know, go start going to church every day. But honestly, talking to someone that you believe in, whether that's God, Jesus, the, another higher power, it really does work. And it makes such a huge difference in your life around you and within you. Like you just feel like so much better having that uh, higher person to believe in and seeing it work through your life. You might not see it immediately, but I promise you, you will see it. And it has gotten me through so much. And I just, I just love it. 
well, I kind of, for me, I view it as a discipline in a way. And it's, um, you know, life can, can come at you in many different directions. And there's, you know, a lot of noise, you know, that mm-hmm. you can easily eliminate. And, you know, whether it's social media, it's news, it's, you know, f- whatever your beliefs are, and you just kind of get caught up in life all the time. And I, I think, you know, for me, you know, having that grounding, you know, going to church, you know, saying your prayers, um, kind of quiets things down. And, um, it really does. you know, I have a hard time opening up my mind to, you know, see what God is telling me at times, but, um, mm-hmm. you know, I continue to try to practice it. And, uh, uh, I do think that, uh, this day and age, uh, you know, my kids probably don't listen to me too much, but I keep telling them, I said, you know, it's gotta be something in your life that grounds you. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and if, if it's not going to be going to church, it's, if it's going to be simply sitting in a quiet room and saying some prayers and so be it. Um, right. but it's, uh, it's a journey and, um, you know, it is. Um, it's, it's refreshing to hear you say that. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like, um, any religion you choose to practice, it truly does ground you and it makes you more of a humble person as well. You start seeing life from a a different view um, and it helps you become a better person, both personally, um, professionally. Um, I just, I really believe in the power of prayer um, and my God as well. I don't want to speak for everyone, but um, (laughs) I really believe in it and I've seen it work. um, And I've, Maybe that's the difference. Maybe not everyone has seen it work and seeing how it works sometimes is really small and you might not notice it, but he is working in everyone's life every day. And I just, well, I just you I love the, it. So. Yeah. And you were on the front line in the ER. So you probably saw some mm-hmm. unbelievable things take place. I did. I've seen, I've seen a lot. Um, I think speaking of that, actually, I believe a lot of us, um, healthcare providers in the ER, sad to say, but it's made us numb to a lot of things. And um, prayer and my religion has actually gotten me through a lot of it because I'm like, this is not normal. I should not be numb to this child dying. Like, this is not normal. So that, in that respect, it's gotten me through um, many emotions, um, telling myself it's okay, um, relying on that to kind of reground me. Um, yeah. Well, it's a great story. So we always leave the audience with five takeaways from our guest. Um, so yeah. hopefully you knew about that question Two. before I'm asking it right now. Uh, yes, <laughs> so, I do have a few. <laughs> yeah, let's hear them. All right. So my first one um, is you should always look inside rather than outside. And when I say that, I mean, how do you feel? Not how does your friend feel or your neighbor feels. I feel like we should never compare ourselves to others. We are all unique individuals and we all feel differently. So speaking of feelings, I want to say my number two, it's okay to feel. Um, I think we all get caught up in um, wanting to feel good and happy all the time. But the reality is there's going to be many situations where you're going to need to feel sad or angry um, or confused. Those are normal feelings. So feel them because holding that in is not good physically and mentally. So allow yourself to feel all the emotions. Um, Number three would be being human is hard, um, but life isn't supposed to be easy. We can we can do hard things. Um, It's what helps mold us into who we are. It makes us stronger and better. So I always say go find activities that you enjoy and that bring meaning to your life. Um, And then number four would be go outside, soak up that air. I love going outside. I like the beach. I love the water, the air, the sunshine, Um, vitamin D, natural vitamin D from the sun um, helps wake up your senses. Um, It's good for the soul, the body, the mind. And if you didn't know, it's also great for fighting inflammation. Um, And then number five would be um, be open to new uh, ideas and adventures. Allow yourself to um, experience new things. Um, Like I said earlier, one shoe doesn't fit all. Sometimes we must try to, um, we we must try on multiple shoes to really find what fits us. So be open, find what fits you. Everyone's different. 
Um, so that's number five. But I do want to say I have one more because I feel it's important. <laughs> it's Valentine's week. And so I felt like this was appropriate. Um, so in honor of Valenti Valentine's week, I wanted to say, allow yourself to love and be loved. Um, most importantly, love yourself. Invest in you. You only have one body, so treat it well. Very good. Uh, great advice. I will say this. I'd like to come back in June or July and ask you how you like the beach then when the population triples, you know, for <laughs> I know. <laughs> the traffic's already terrible now. We were talking about that. The traffic's going to be 10 times worse. So I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, you may be back up this way at some point. <laughs> <I know. laughs> right. Well, Candy, it was a joy to talk to you today and uh, uh, thrilled that you're with Optimal Bio and uh, look forward to hearing more about you in the future. But as always, God bless and um, thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. I've enjoyed this so much and God bless you all. Thank you. This has been a production of Optimal Bio. Optimal Bio is CEO Tyler Brannon, podcast host and partner Jim Baker, medical director Greg Brannon, Production assistance by Core Media. Beth Gravencourt, Administrator. Kevin Duthu, Executive Producer. The podcast can be found on our website, OptimalBio.com, on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Our theme song is Sunwave by Paradiso, provided by Epidemic Sound.